You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from theheart.org on Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for January 8th, 2021. This week, America, COVID, trial translation, valve guidelines, and social media. For months on end, the pandemic has rightly distracted us from almost everything medical and certainly cardiology. Before Wednesday, it would have been hard to believe that anything else could have been bigger news than the third wave of this pandemic. But there I was on Wednesday afternoon, in between cases and patient visits, staring at my phone in disbelief that the crucible of our republic has been invaded by a mob of nut jobs. Five people have died from this awfulness. I've been to Washington and I've visited these buildings. While you know that politicians are just flawed people, like all of us, you can feel the history in these places. It feels somewhat like being in an old church in Italy. It feels solemn. So, Sad. Sad is how I feel. Sad for this nation. What I hope for, though, is that perhaps this is a spark. Perhaps leaders can come together, reach out, and get back to the business of trying to help this nation heal. Democrats are in charge now, and that's fine. Let's see if they can do it. If they can't, there are other elections, and so it goes. In eighth grade American history classes, we learned that America has come through many nadirs, So I will remain hopeful and optimistic. Now to COVID. Just before Christmas, there was a nationwide decrease in cases. Our hospital went from 100 COVID admissions to about 50. Things looked better, a lot better. Then, boom, in the last couple of weeks, cases are back up, way up. And certain areas are struggling a lot. I have colleagues in L.A. and Texas, and they tell of severe stress in their hospital systems for more cases. I saw this week that we had more than 4,000 people die from COVID in one day. I was thinking of a word that describes this virus, and I I came up with bedeviling. Let me know if you have a better one. It's just crazy. The good news is that we now have millions of doses of highly effective vaccines going out. While the rollout in the U.S. has been less than perfect, the optimistic case of vaccines ending the pandemic looks more and more realistic. I'm also mildly reassured that millions have received the vaccines already, and I haven't seen any trends in serious adverse events. Now, for those of you who, like me, are intrigued by trials and trial translation, there's a great debate on vaccines has emerged, and that is the one-shot versus two-shot vaccine rollout. In the Pfizer and Moderna trials, efficacy was greater than 90%, but they were both two-shot regimens. So if we were to treat vaccine intervention as we do, say, ICDs, or TAVR, or mitroclips, or anticoagulants for atrial fib, we would strictly adhere to the trials. But then there's modeling data that has shown that delaying the second shot in an effort to get more people, one shot, especially the vulnerable people, that might save lives overall. Proponents of this one-shot strategy delve deep into the trials, and they do these post-hoc kind of analysis showing that efficacy after one shot is good enough. The utilitarian, or benefit-the-most, take favors the one-shot technique. But then you have virologists, like Dr. Florian Kramer, warning that one-shot strategies may encourage selection pressure towards more resistant strains of the virus. Now, I'm not going to go on and on on this. You know that a cardiologist doesn't have the content expertise to have an opinion. But following this debate that pits individual health versus population health and the translation of trial data to the real world, this is super educational. Okay, now valve guidelines. A day before my last episode, the ACC and AHA released a new guideline document for treating patients with valvular heart disease. 
Oh, it's a massive document. And I say congratulations to Drs. Catherine Otto and Rick Nishimura and all the other authors of this. I can only imagine how many Zoom calls this paper entailed. The main document is 156 pages. I'll try to hit some highlights. And let's start with their second top take-home message. The authors highlight the history and physical exam and that these should be correlated with non-invasive tests. I know what you might be thinking. You're like, come on, Mandrola, that is anodyne. Let's just get to the Taver and Mitroclip business. But no, it is not. In the real world of clinical practice, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to do a good history and exam. Why? Because valve disease isn't a STEMI. Uncommon is a low-risk patient with isolated severe AS or a patient with acute leaflet tear. These decisions are easy. Most often, treating patients with valve disease requires a clinician who sees the whole person. Did they come into the office with a walker? How much dementia do they have? What are their goals? Who is helping them at home? Do they shop for themselves? Good doctoring is also important because of this. Regurgitant lesions are often hard to quantify but they are super easy to use to scare patients into interventions. Did the severe mitral regurgitation occur after a week of indiscretion after Thanksgiving, or say, after a week of AFib with an uncontrolled rate? Kudos to the authors for highlighting the need for doctors to use doctoring skills. Okay, highlight number two is the strong mention of the MDT, or multidisciplinary team. The authors give this a level one recommendation. It's based on expert opinion, basically no evidence. But I would suggest you don't need a color-coded box or evidence to understand the importance of discussing a patient's case with clinicians that have different points of view. I saw a quote-unquote real multidisciplinary team meetings when I visited Edinburgh, Scotland last year, and I came away impressed. Now, here are some of my worries, though, about multidisciplinary team meetings. The patient isn't usually there to advocate for themselves. Second, depending on the circumstances, does one point of view dominate? Are the surgeons driving decisions, or is it the interventionalist? Or is it true collaboration? Is there really robust critical appraisal of the, say, TAVR versus SAVR data? Is there a palliative care or geriatrics clinician there to help clinicians see past those scary color Dopplers? And I feel funny saying this because my friends Ajay and Sunil might get mad But underlying the American MDT, or Multidisciplinary Team Meeting, or Valve Conference, is the conflict of interest born from our productivity-based compensation. In many, if not most, hospitals these days, power and status and compensation comes from being a high producer. And I'll refuse to be cynical about this, but I think it would be naive to deny conflict of interest in these Valve Conference meetings. Highlight number three, the guideline authors give great leeway for the choice of TAVR in patients for whom a bioprosthetic valve is appropriate. What is strange to me is their choice to define categories here based on age. For instance, they give 1A recommendations for symptomatic patients between ages 65 and 80 years to have either TAVR or SAVR after shared decision making. That is strange because the trials underpinning these recommendations were not based on age. The trials were based on surgical risk. Now, why wouldn't the writers stay consistent with surgical risk? For instance, the average age in the intermediate risk trials was 79 to 80 years. Dr. Victor Dayan, a heart surgeon and president of the Latin American Association of Cardiac Surgeons, sent me a statement from their group opposing this distinction based on age. Their point is well taken. Keep in mind that the five-year results of Partner 2A, that's the intermediate risk RCT, shows a clear late change in the Kaplan-Meier curves of the primary endpoint of stroke or death, and this was favoring SAVR, surgical aortic valve replacement. The RCT data in low-risk patients shows a similar pattern. The two-year data from Partner 3, which was presented this year, shows a clear-cut catch-up phenomenon in hard outcomes of death or stroke. And what I mean by catch-up is that the early advantage of TAVR over surgical valve replacement looks to be lessened over two years. Additionally, the number of patients in the low-risk trials is quite small, and the small numbers adds uncertainty. 
In the document text, page E30, the authors justify their choice to use age-based TAVA recommendations, and this was based on a 2019 meta-analysis by Siantis et al., and I'll cite that in the show notes. Here is their quote. TAVR is a safe and effective procedure for the treatment of severe symptomatic AS in all adults, regardless of estimated surgical risk. The mortality rate for transfemoral TAVR is lower than that for SAVR with a hazard ratio of 0.88 and confidence intervals that range from 0.78 to 0.99 in this meta-analysis of RCTs. Ah, but the problem with that meta-analysis is that it lumps in trials that should not be lumped together. A significant driver of that barely significant hazard ratio was mortality benefit in elderly high-risk patients. Also, another issue was the inclusion of one- to two-year data from the low-risk trials of which only a small number had completed follow-up. Now, this is striking to me because it seems obvious that the TAVR versus SAVR decision in, say, a 70-year-old with low to intermediate surgical risk ought to be determined only by the longest-term data from patients in that category. And you see the problem. If you say TAVR or SAVR are equally okay, who in their right mind is going to choose SAVR? A 68- or 70-year-old patient with isolated aortic stenosis has a long life ahead of them. Five-year data, 10-year data is important. Thus, in my opinion, the longer-term issues with TAVR relative to SAVR including higher rates of aortic insufficiency, more pacemakers, and unknown valve durability, should have received a lot more attention. As an electrophysiologist who sees the problems of pacemakers, the increased rate of pacing with TAVR is underappreciated. I've been wrong before, but I predict that the longer-term data for Partner 3 in the lower-risk study will show TAVR to be inferior to surgical valve replacement when looking at heart outcomes. And I know there'll be iterations of this technique and no one wants their sternum sawed open, but five to 10 year data seems super important when we're talking about patients in their 60s and 70s. Okay, the fourth issue with the valve guidelines is of course functional mitral regurgitation. The authors give percutaneous edge-to-edge repair with MitraClip, a class 2A recommendation based on the results of the COAP trial. Now, obviously, most listeners of the podcast know that while the industry-funded COAP trial found MitraClip to be hugely beneficial in terms of reduced heart failure and death, the government-funded French MitraFR study showed no difference. Now, guideline authors explain the difference based on enrolled patients in medical therapy. COAP enrolled patients with smaller LVs, more mitral regurgitation, and these patients had more rigorous medical management. Dr. Milton Packer and colleagues wrote a compelling paper in Jack Imaging shortly after these trials came out in which they explained the disparate results of the two functional MR trials using the concept of proportionate and disproportionate mitral regurge. Their theory is that the positive COAP trial enrolled patients with disproportionate mitral regurge, thus the benefit from mitral clip. Disproportionate mitral regurg is basically more regurgitation than you would expect based on the LV size. Now, this is a nice idea. It's a plausible idea. It's a great paper. The problem is that in real life, echo parameters of which they're talking about are pretty challenging to quantify. I mean, you have one trial that shows mitral clip is as good as clean drinking water and antibiotics, and the other trial shows no benefit. And you want to hang this difference on a few millimeter measurements of orifice area and LV measurements. Now, make no mistake, I don't deny that there are patients who might benefit from this procedure, but I suspect they are very small in number and must be highly, highly selected. For instance, I've talked to doctors who participated in the COAB trial, and they say it was very difficult to get patients enrolled because of these extremely selective entry criteria. For all of these reasons, I would have given the mitral clip for functional mitral regurgitation a lower recommendation. Now, another comment, the current climate of needing to find mitral clip patients is not the guideline author's issue. But in real life, I'm very concerned that the need to keep fledgling structural programs afloat could be a strong tailwind to find suitable patients for this procedure. Remember, these measurements are made in millimeters, and mitral regurgitation is very load-dependent and dynamic. This is a challenging procedure that requires practice. 
If we were doing mitral clip for functional mitral regurgitation in, say, a Canadian model, in which only a few centers and small numbers of operators were doing highly selected patients, I'd be a lot less worried about this procedure. A final brief comment on guideline documents. I know this will never happen, but these documents I think would be far better without the color-coded boxes and levels of recommendations. Close your eyes for a second and imagine a guideline document with just the supporting text and references. In this case, then, the document might actually be used for guidance rather than the rule of law. Final topic today is on social media. JAMA Internal Medicine published a research letter on the prevalence of online harassment. The group of authors from Chicago designed a survey and they put it out on their respective social media feeds. Of 1,100 views, 464 clinicians responded. About one in four clinicians reported personal attacks. 16% of women respondents reported sexual harassment. Journalist Ken Terry has a nice report on his paper on Medscape Medical News. As many of you know, I was an early adopter of social media and have been an advocate for an online presence. I see far more benefits and harms for being present in the online space for two big reasons. First, if you choose not to participate, your online presence is made for you, say by those silly doctor grading sites. If you Google John Mandrola, you find my blog, my Twitter feed, and my publications. I have defined who I am. I highly recommend that you do the same. The second reason to be online is to keep up with prevailing trends in medical education. In electrophysiology, for instance, I've learned practice changing things from colleagues who are posting online. His bundle pacing, for example. Now, I am a far more informed doctor because of the things I learn online, from statistics to trial appraisal to pharmacology to economics and even philosophy. I follow people online who help me to think and how to think and what to think about. But, but being active online comes with downsides. I wish it were not so, but the openness of social media can bring vitriol. I agree strongly with what Dr. Esther Chu said in the Medscape News piece. She said that harassment is part of the deal. Chu said she barely even notices the negative aspects of the social media environment anymore. Well, I want to be careful about what I say about this because white males do not have to put up with sexual harassment. But to me, dealing with this vitriol is easy on Twitter. You just mute people who don't engage in good faith and you report and block accounts that are threatening. I do a lot more muting than blocking. And two final comments. First, if you post about political topics, you should expect strong pushback. It goes without saying that levels of polarization are high. American doctors largely agree on the diagnosis of societal ills, but we have widely disparate views on the policy solutions. That's okay. Second, and I leave this comment for last, nasty comments from anonymous accounts are not a representative sample of society at large. Please remember your lessons about sampling and statistics. Consider this. If you fell off your bike and were injured, the overwhelming majority of people in this country would be hell-bent on helping you, regardless of who they voted for. So that's it for this week in cardiology, and I realize that this is a cardiology podcast, and today it wasn't as much cardiology as normal, but this was such a remarkable week that I just couldn't help but be distracted. I hope that next week we can get back to mostly or all cardiology topics. As always, I am grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, please help us, uh, give us a rating, write us a review. That helps other people find the podcast. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org on Medscape.